gentlemen. Good to be in the house of God. Glad you say it, say amen. amen. The Lord is good. As to pray for the some of us are going to be, or some are going to be traveling to the music school and first again of this you know, leaving today. Leaving today. And so uh, be in prayer for them, safe travels. We pray for my brother Gary, he fell in a hole and twisted his ankle. Anybody else we need to pray for this morning? Uh, yes, I uh, got a message this morning that uh, Brother Joseph Allen, who is a pastor of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, he was here in Greece a couple of years ago, but they had two church members that died in a tragic accident. That's all it said. And asked for the prayers of uh, God's people. On behalf of the Madness family, I'd like to thank the church for all your prayers, the car, the flowers, the wonderful meal, and the love, the show, the passion. I especially want to thank Mark for the service. It's a real comfortable thing. It really makes me appreciate my church family. Amen. Anybody else? I'd like to say a passage for the people that are leaving tomorrow to go to uh, Facebook. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a bus that live on one side. I told him he's going to have to choose the back or on the other side. <laughs> Keep it from burning. Well, I'm going to say a passage for those that are leaving tomorrow.
of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. You can be seated this morning. Peter's been preaching to the people of Israel. And uh, not only that, but he's been preaching in the midst of this crowd that is gathered around the lame man that was healed at the temple. You remember he laid in the gate, which is called Beautiful. Y'all remember that part, don't you? And he was healed, and, and the crowd gathered around to, to, uh, to, to gawk at the man. That's a good old Texas word. And, uh, and Peter took the opportunity to preach. The evidence could not be denied that God was moving and working. It tells us in, uh, in chapter, chapter 4 and verse, verses 15, 16, and 17, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them, as manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. Listen to this, and we cannot deny it. Uh, but that is spread no further, let us straightly threaten them. That, that, they couldn't deny the hand of God. You understand, in our world, it's hard to deny. You have to work hard at denying the hand of God. I mean, those who choose not to believe in God can make up all, but they have to work at it, have to make up all kinds of strange ideas and strange stories uh, to explain away. They're still trying to figure out how we lost one day in the history of our world. They're still trying to figure out uh, how everything came to be out of nothing. And they have to make up stories to do it. We've got the Big Bang and the Big Rip and the Big Evolution and the Big Everything. How about just the Big God, somebody say. But Peter was preaching to them about Jesus Christ. And he wasn't just doing it ignorantly. He knew exactly what he was doing. If you go back to chapter 3 and look at verse number 12... Uh, well, verse number 11, the people had gathered on the porch, which is called Solomon's. They're gathered there to, uh, to uh, look at the spectacle, this man that has been healed. And then the very first part of verse number 12 says, And when Peter saw it, he, he saw the people gathering, and he knew that this was his opportunity to preach the gospel. Let me just pause right here and tell you this morning, Believers, if you are interested in spreading the gospel, if you're interested in getting the gospel to people, you might want to know that you're probably not going to back into evangelism. You're not just going to fall off into evangelism more than likely. It's going to be something that is done on purpose. Because you decided to share the gospel with somebody. Evangelism becomes something that's systematic. It's something that you do. Uh, it, it, it's a testimony that you've rehearsed over and over again that you share with people and done on purpose. But can I tell you that evangelism or getting the gospel to people can get real messy just like it did here in Acts chapter number 4. That's what we're preaching about this morning, the messiness of evangelism. Uh, it's not all cut and dry. It's not always clean and clear, it's not always easy and peaceful to share the gospel with every creature. We may have a run in with the law. Isn't that right? I mean, we get right about it, we get serious about it, and we don't notice that too much here, but we've got missionaries far and wide. Brother Don Newland's already been run out of Vietnam once for preaching the gospel. Did you know that there were churches, and I'm talking about churches in our circle, if I started calling names, I'm not going to because they're putting this on the internet anymore, but you'd know these churches that would not support him because, hey, he was breaking the law in Vietnam. 
Well, it's against the law in Vietnam to preach the gospel. It's against the law in China to preach the gospel. Wake up and get with the program, folks. Not every country is like America, and America's headed just like every other country. It can get real messy around here. We start talking about having run-ins with the law, just like they did in Acts chapter number 4 and those verses we just read. Some have taken exception in our world to the preaching of the gospel. I think it's interesting here to note that it was the religious world who stepped up to take the most exception to the preaching of the gospel. Those priests and captain of the temple and Sadducees of verse number 1. Why is it that religion, the world of religion, uh, takes exception to the preaching of the truth of God's Word and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, the world of religion has contempt for those who preach the truth of God's Word. Did you know what we preach, what we believe, and we preach here in this, uh, from this pulpit since 1903 is considered heresy by me. Uh, it may be the little lady down the street that goes to uh, the other denomination, but it doesn't change the fact that they look at the, at the people of God in contempt and, and, and claim heresy upon us for what we preach and believe. You know, I've been called a heretic just because I don't believe a person has to be baptized to be saved. Well, if that's what they want to label me as, so be it. But that's the religious world we live in. They have contempt. Not only that, but there's, there's the element of competition. These, these people in Israel, these religious of Israel, they did not want the Christian community rising up and offering them any kind of competition. You go down to Mexico where Brother Benito is and there's always this ever-looming contention of the Roman Catholic Church, which is the state church in Mexico, and, uh, and the, the Baptist missionaries and the Baptist churches that are there. And I can tell you this, it's not because that Roman Catholic Church is worried about whether or not Brother Benito dies and goes to hell. They're not worried about his soul. They're worried about that money that's coming in and getting taken out of their offering plate and put in somebody else's. And then also there's the element of corruption in the religious world. These, these religious of the apostles' days here in the first part of the book of Acts, they were a little bit worried that the Christian community would rise up and expose the truth about the false religion that they had been living in all these years. You see, there's many in our religious world today who do not want to be exposed for the false religion that they are. So they took exception to the preaching of the truth. They didn't like them. They didn't like the church. You're taking notes this morning, number one, they didn't like their doctrine. Write this word down. They didn't like their doctrine because it was biblical. Verse number 2 tells us that, uh, that they were grieved, that they, listen to this word, that they taught the people. That's the same Greek word that Paul used over there in 2 Timothy whenever he told him to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Same word. You see, the apostles had doctrine. First of all, the apostles were biblicists. They were going by the Bible. They, if you read through these sermons that we've looked at that the apostle Peter is preaching, and I think, I think it's not a far stretch to say that John and some of the other ones were throwing a word in here and there too. It says they that they taught, that they taught, and they had doctrine. They were biblicists. They were, they were talking about the Old Testament. They were drawing out Old Testament scriptures. Peter's talked about David. Paul goes on a little while to talk about David and Moses and Abraham later on. Uh, all of these, they were bringing out the Old Testament. They were adding in the New Testament, which they were writing even as they didn't even know they were writing. 
They dealt with history. They dealt with prophecy. They dealt with past events. They dealt with present application. You see, for the hyper-dispensationalist that says that we only go by the, the Pauline epistles of the Bible and everything else doesn't have anything to do with us, can you tell me why these apostles were bringing up so much of the Old Testament? They were biblicists. Their, their doctrine was based upon the infallible, inerrant Word of God. You see, to teach the truth of the Bible excludes a lot of religion in this world today. You preach the Bible, it excludes a lot about what Roman Catholics teach. I don't find nothing about purgatory in my Bible. If you preach the Bible, I'm not talking about the whole Bible, it blows Calvinism out of the water. How, how, are you going to, how are you going to take the gospel to every creature? How are you going to be responsible for whether or not you tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ if they're already predetermined to go to heaven or hell? You see, it doesn't all add up. It doesn't mesh together. To declare the whole counsel of God is to blow baptismal regeneration out of the water. To preach the truth of God's Word, it, 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 it blows the people that believe in conventions and hierarchies and organizations out of the water. And, and you're left with a local, independent Baptist church. But even before I'm a Baptist, I'm a Biblicist. We believe in the infallible, inerrant Word of God. And I thank God that I have a Bible that I can trust. I believe every word of it, don't you? I mean, I had a guy tell me one time on his deathbed, I know why you're here to talk to me, and I know you believe that Bible, but I don't believe a word of it. I said, friend, I believe every word of it. Every word. I'm glad we have a Bible that we can put our faith in, and, and we can open it up, and we can know how to do family, and we can know how to do church, and we can know how to have a personal walk and, and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They yeah. had some doctrine. They were biblicists. Not only were they biblicists, they were creationists. Peter and John were the one who were uh, foremost here in this passage of Scripture. Can I remind you what John said in John chapter 1 and verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John was a creationist. Uh, it filtered on into the church because you get over here in chapter 4 of Acts in verse number 24, the church is gathered together. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God which has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. There was some doctrine there. They were creationists. You see, the, the creation... They call it intelligent design. I hate that term. It's, om, it, it, it's omniscient design is what it is. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's God design. But that's a, that's a foundational doctrine that we have. That God created everything out of nothing. But see, in the, in, in the religious circles of our day, of our modern day, uh, many of their uh, of their successes depend upon popularity with the world, and this creates a problem because the world doesn't believe in God, and they don't believe He created it. They were creationists. They held that as a doctrine. Not only were they biblicists and creationists in doctrine, they were also Zionists. They believed in that God had a special blessing and a special purpose for Israel on this earth. Well, that was a touchy subject back in that day because Israel was uh, waiting on a Messiah to come and set up the kingdom and, and they're here preaching Jesus and Jesus laid down his life. How in the world is he going to set up a kingdom when he's in the grave? And Peter's trying to explain all of this to them. That was a touchy subject back then. I can tell you right now, the nation of Israel is still a touchy subject today. 
And if the liberal left and their politics turn against Israel, and they will, they turn against Israel, where, where, where are the liberals going to go to church? I can tell you it's not going to be here probably. They're not going to like it here because we have a doctrine about the belief of what God has planned for Israel. Not only that, but in doctrine they were resurrectionists. Verse number 2, it grieved them that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. From the dead. The Apostle Peter and the other apostles, they believed in the resurrection from the dead. They believed in it spiritually speaking that when a person is saved that they're brought from death unto life spiritually but they also believed in the resurrection physically. That one of these days that Jesus will come again and receive us unto Himself. And when He comes in the rapture, that the, that, that the children of God, the, those who have died in Christ, will be resurrected from the grave and receive a new body. I don't care what the Bible critics of today say. I don't care what the Bible critics of history have said. I don't care if they believe it or not. My doctrine and the doctrine of this church is the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the soon coming bodily resurrection of the people of God. I tell you this morning, my hope's in that. I about wore this body out already. I got a long time to go to live. If I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd have took better care of myself. My hope's in that resurrection. So, well, preacher, that's pretty far-fetched to believe that the Lord God is going to call people out of the graves and the graves are going to burst open. And listen, I believe God is able to do it, don't you? I don't care if you've been cremated or eaten by a shark or blown up with a bomb. I think God is able to put it back together and change our vile bodies and, 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 the, and the corruptible can put on incorruption in Jesus Christ. Listen, if He's able to take a black-hearted sinner and save their soul and wash them white as snow, He's able to bring us forth from the grave. They were resurrectionists. I didn't like that doctrine. You see, there was some Sadducees in that crowd that didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ or His people. That's why they call them Sadducees. They were sad, you see. <laughs> they didn't like their doctrine. Number two, they didn't like their dogmatism. Because write this word down, they were too blunt. Too blunt. Now, if they just water it down a little bit. But you see, it says that they were grieved that they taught the people, listen to this, and preached through Jesus. They preached Jesus, what they did. Well, that's too blunt. They just preached Jesus. Well, uh, preacher, let's, let's talk about those chief priests and uh, the captain of the temple. Let's talk about, no, let's just talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the Pope and the elders of this church. And now let's just talk about Jesus. They just preached Jesus. Oprah Winfrey would have hyperventilated. They just preached Jesus. You know, she's the one who said there must be several ways to God. They just preached Jesus. They preached Jesus Christ, the believer's only resource, only source of righteous power. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Talking about the healing of this lame man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, verse number 8, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, listen to verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand. He's our only resource of power. 
I mean, they, they made some pretty, pretty interesting insults against Peter and the church down in verse 13. They said they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. But Peter and John didn't even deny that. They didn't deny that they were ignorant and unlearned upon their own. They stood in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were acting in the power of Christ. If there's any power in preaching today, if there's any power in personal testimony and witness today, I'm telling you, it's in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord be not here with us, our preaching is in vain. If the Spirit of God be not here, our preaching is in vain. Listen, the preacher doesn't claim any power upon himself to be able to convince anybody or persuade anybody for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just sailboats. We're just waiting for the wind to come by so we can stick up our sail and get in on it. But if there's no wind, we're not going to get anywhere. They believed in the power of Christ. Not only that, but they preached dogmatically that Jesus was our ultimate source for healing in verse number 10. Be it known unto you. Be it known unto you that in the name of Jesus Christ, this man stands here whole. He's our only. Who healed this man? They said Jesus did. Yeah, but you're the one that. That, uh, that, 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 that touched him well, but it was Jesus. Jesus did. Jesus healed him. Let me ask you about you this morning. What about you when you were sick or when you were in the hospital? Who healed you? Well, you know, thank God for doctors and thank God for the pills we need and the, and the drugs we need and the resources that we have. And I'll tell you something. If you're on your sick bed or your deathbed and you got up, you, you better praise God for it. He's the one that brought you out of it. Not only that, but they dogmatically preached that Jesus Christ is the sinner's only means of salvation. Verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? Well, Oprah said, surely he's not the only way. Peter said, yes, he is. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Well, surely you don't believe that, preacher. Yes, I do. No other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Yeah. It's the sinner's only means of salvation. That's dogmatic. You see what happened here when Pastor Peter stepped up to the pulpit, diplomacy walked out the back door and dogmatism stepped in. You understand, people get saved and the gospel goes forth when the Word of God is preached dogmatically. Whenever you preach that there's only one of two places you're going to spend eternity when you leave this world is either in heaven or in hell and hopefully you're saved and spend an eternity in heaven. That's dogmatic. People don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Dogmatic about the judgment of God that if you die without Christ you'll stand before an almighty God a thrice holy God and he'll say depart from me I never knew you that's dogmatic not only preaching about the wrath of God but dogmatically preaching about the goodness of God that he's good on the mountain and he's good in the valley and he's good when you're having a bad day and he's good when you're having a good day you see some people, some of you heard a message on hell and, and, and ran to Jesus and got saved. But for others of you, it was a message about the goodness of God. The Bible says that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. It needs to be dogmatic. He's good. You should have died in that accident. You should have died in your sin. But the goodness of God came by your way. He's our only means of salvation. Dogmatically, they preached that He's our only hope of resurrection. They preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It's our only hope of resurrection. You understand it's not the money that's spent on a funeral. That's our hope of getting out of that grave. It's not the sermon that's preached over us when we die. Uh, that, that, that's our hope of coming out of that grave. It's not the cemetery that you're buried in 
or, or the flowers that are planted there or who comes to visit your... None of that has anything to do with it. Friend, if you're not saved, you're not coming out of that grave in the rapture. You'll come out of it just in time to be at the white throne judgment. Be cast into hell for eternity. Our hope of resurrection is found in placing our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our only hope. Well, it just wasn't so dogmatic. Number three, they didn't like their determination. You write this word down, they were a little bit too bold. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. It upset them. If, if, they, if, if the preacher, if the people of God just weren't so determined. They were determined, first of all, that they were going to preach the truth of God at all costs. Verse 2, they preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. I think, I think they had an idea what that was going to stir up. And then in verse, uh, verse number 20 of chapter 4, uh, Peter said, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were determined that they were going to preach the truth of God's Word. We need to get today to where we can say we're going to preach the truth of God no matter what. We're going to preach it in church. We're going to preach it on the streets. We're going to preach it from house to house. If I go to jail, I'm going to preach it. They can kill me. I'll preach it till they do. The church can run me out of this pulpit and I'll preach it somewhere else, but I'm going to preach the truth of God's Word. Yeah, but if it just wasn't so dogmatic and determined, so preachy, they were determined to get the gospel in the ears of people. Chapter 4, verse 4 now be it many of them which heard the word. That was their idea. They, they wanted to get the word. Peter knew exactly when he saw the crowd gathering. Back in chapter 3, he knew this is my opportunity to get the word to them. He was determined to get the gospel in their ear. Chapter 4, verse number 17. Uh, it uses that word spread. That it spread no further. That was their determination. They wanted to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the church gets in on it. It gets behind it. Down in verses 29, 30, and 31. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Oh, they're bold. They're determined. They were determined. And bold to get the gospel into the ears of anyone who would listen. Understanding that if they don't, if I don't get the gospel to them. If I don't share the gospel with them. That hearts will continually become harder and harder. It's going to be harder for them to get saved every day. That they live outside of the will of God. Opportunities are going to pass for them to hear and understand the gospel. Possibly people will die and go to hell if I don't preach the gospel. Determined to get the, to get the word of God, the gospel, in their ear. What if the people of God today got so determined to get the gospel to lost people? There's no telling what might happen. The people of God would get involved in church and any type of outreach that we can, get involved in personal witnessing from one person to another, get involved in praying for opportunities. When's the last time you prayed that God would send you somebody that you could share the gospel with you? Some of you aren't praying for opportunities because you're scared God will give one to you. <coughs> determined, determined to get the gospel in their ear. 
If I understand the verse correctly, it says about 5,000 people got saved. Well, I can tell you this, Peter and John, they didn't have any control over that. That was not their determination. Their determination was not that people got saved. That was their desire. But their determination was simply to give the gospel to them. Can I tell you that's the way it ought to be today too? It's my determination to give the gospel to every person that will listen. It, it, it's my determination. But I'm not determined to, to save anybody. That's between them and God. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't my desire. I want people to get saved. But whether or not they get saved, that's between the hearer and God. You understand when the... When the saving becomes our determination, that's whenever we start manipulating people and start drawing confessions out of people and start bringing people down. We just say the sinner's prayer over 200 people and, and hey, we'll just declare them saved. It becomes about numbers instead of about the soul. My determination is not to save anybody, but to make sure you have all the information you need to be saved. So I tell you one more time this morning, you're not saved. Jesus Christ died for your sin. You could be saved. You could have all of your sins forgiven if you'll turn to Him and place your faith and trust in Christ today. If you need to be saved, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Believers, in these last days, and I believe we're living in them, don't you? Are we living in the last days? Amen. These last days, evangelism may get messy. Uh, not everyone loves the faith like we do. You understand that, don't you? So I leave you with a question this morning. What are you willing to endure? What are you willing to endure in order to preach the gospel to every creature? May get messy. Maybe today is a good day for us to commit to the Lord whatever you want me to do. I'll do it. I don't care what the law is. I don't care what people say. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Did not Peter say, he said right in that verse, he said, whether it be right with you or right with God, you judge. Uh, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We're going to have to make a decision one of these days where we stand on this. You come as we sing a verse of invitation. Hymn yeah, number 177.